I kind of wondered when we started looking at this idea of teaching social studies through political cartoons would be out there for all this um, because sometimes social studies is something that as they're looking at everything. But we have people who are, are glad to have everything today. Um, Debbie Fawcett probably will not be able to um, join us today. Um, we'll see if she to catch in a little bit later. But I do have with me Tico Henry, who is making sure that all the technology is working as we're going through there. Um, we will try to do our best terms of you know making sure that the audio is clear and we'll see how things are going from there so i do have a couple of people who are saying that the audio is bouncing in and out maybe we can correct some of that as we're going through okay and i still keep hearing that going through so tico may take a look and see what from there, um, Tico, is that, that, am I coming in and out with you? You are, and that's because people are dialing in. And like I said earlier, Susan, I never heard that before, like where I can hear the Okay. So here is the issue thing right now is that we still have a lot of people who are coming in to the point. And so there is a clicking that's going on that, and that's causing that. But hopefully, in just a few more months, um, we'll be able to, we'll have a lot less of that happening. Um, if we continue to have those kinds of problems, we'll try to, to work around some of the other areas. Um, right now, I'm not hearing anyone come in, so hopefully, uh, you're doing much in terms of that. But Tico, if there is something that keeps going um, that you hear from me besides the clicking in the back, um, let me know and we'll work with No, it's just that it's kind of thing. So like once the, the, the bling then we can hear you again. So I, I'm guessing once um, the, the, the dialing in slows down, then we should be good to go. Thank you so much, yes, folks, as we have a few newcomers are coming in. But let's take um, because I'm going to ask this question. If you'll notice, over to the side, you should have a question box. Is tell me where are you, and if you would include your city and state. Wow, see, we have people from Illinois, from Pennsylvania, from Mississippi, Texas. Oh, hello, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Um, we have people from California. Um, we have people from Virginia and even Washington State. Um, good to see you in with us as well. Colorado Springs. I heard that there was quite a bit of snow coming down out in Colorado, so I. Um, and welcome, uh, Clarissa, uh, no, let's see, it's Dawn from Cheyenne, Wyoming. Wow. We're pulling in from everywhere, and we that you are with us um, as we're moving through. Actually, right now, have just almost 250 attendees, so, and they're coming in from everywhere. So glad to have everyone with us. Eric, you, I was just out there. Okay, so let's take a look. I'm actually sitting in North Carolina. Um, able to join us. She will be coming in from Louisiana. And Tico, where are you? Washington, D.C. Tico is in Washington, D.C. So um, 
So we've got things covered out there from different places. Again, thank you for so here is what we are going to do. We're going to look at the base of political cartoons um, because we all know this is an issue that our students struggle with um, incredibly. Um, we're going to look at how political cartoons, kind of what the role they have played throughout U.S. history. And by putting these things together, hopefully be able to help students learn how to interpret, but just maybe learn a little bit more about history. One thing that we will do is we will share resources. If you take a look um, on your menu on the right-hand side, you will see where there are handouts. And those handouts include a scavenger hunt that is from the National Archives, the webinar for that, and also an answer key that goes along with um, the Constitution scavenger hunt. All of the that we have here will be posted on the GED Testing Service website. Um, it will be there within the next few days. At the most, it will be next month. Um, that is also where you will be able to um, pull down a certificate attending today's session. Over that again as we get toward the end of the session, um, but just so that you know, if you wanted to open up the handouts right now, you could do that. Um, you don't, you certainly don't have to do it at this point because all of this will be available to you um, as we move through. So let's start with the cartoon. Uh, remember when. There sits something that many of us might have tucked away in a closet somewhere, um, but probably not to use these anymore, and that's a cassette player uh, and that cassette, uh, compact cassette itself. You know, that thing actually came out in the 60s. So can anyone tell, and you can just jump the box, what did we have before we had pack cassettes? There was another thing that was out there. Yes, I got some people here, Yolanda and Cecilia, Dawn, Shanna. The eight track. Oh yes, those eight track tapes and you know you, you when you got them in the car, it was an amazing thing. And Angelina, yes, you're absolutely right. There were actually records. There were vinyl records that we had. So this may not be something, this cartoon that shows close history, um, but it is a good way of talking with students about what came before, what happened. Yes. Lori, you're absolutely right. There were 33s and 78s for those records that we had out there and how much we appreciated those. And now there's actually a little bit of those things back uh, uh, into use. In fact, you can go some places and you can find the old record player. There's eight track tapes anywhere, but there are some things that are there. Um, of course, now we have access to just literally millions of songs and recordings and all through technology. So let's take a look as we go. This is where you actually begin some things with students, is you start first with something like a current cartoon. Um, I recommend andertunes.com. You see that up at the top. Um, I actually have a membership where I get things from him, um, and it's not that expensive. But also, you can be a part of um, his mailing list. And Mark Anderson um, is the cartoonist. He does wonderful cartoons, and actually, I get the cartoon of the day, which is a wonderful thing, just to even brighten up my day as I'm going through. We may not always think about it, 
But if we really take a look, Thomas Jefferson said it right. You know, that it's the duty of every good citizen to use all the opportunities which occur to him for preserving documents relating to the history of our country. And when we think about that, what do we think of? We think of the Declaration of Independence. We think of the Constitution. We think of the Bill of Rights and all of those different things. We also, cartoons have played a big part in U.S. history. Um, as we've moved through. So it's important, and the National Archives has a huge collection of the earliest of the cartoons that are out there. So let's just do kind of a quick review before we get back into this of the cartoons itself about what should I teach. And social studies, we have a couple here. We have this big umbrella that's all that social studies ever want to know, but then it breaks down into two different parts, focusing things and social studies practices. But keep in mind that as students get ready for the social studies test, one of those things that's really important is that students have that ability to analyze and evaluate what they read so they can create meaning and understanding. So this is not about memorizing all kinds of different esoteric things within social studies, but it is about having an understanding of the big ideas. So when we look at things, we look at two areas where questions are clustered, development of modern liberties and democracy, and we have those dynamic responses systems. That is a fancy way of saying how did different things that occurred impact other issues? So we could take World War II and look at it from a standpoint of how did it change public policy? How did it change economics? How did it change people moved from one place into another place? Keep in mind that on the DED social studies test, that the development of modern liberties and democracy, the dynamic responses in societal systems, the question would be able to fit within those two things. So if they fall out of that, then they're not a part of what would be assessed. When I take a look at content across, there are two areas that I feel are most important for our students, and it just that 70% of the test revolves around civics and government and U.S. history. And we can combine those two and we can look at these things through the lens of political cartoons. But the need, and that is that they really need to have these social studies practices. So I want you to think about this for a minute. Our students need to be able to draw conclusions and make inferences. That's two big issues for many of the students that we have. They also need to be able to interpret me and think of those political cartoons, symbols, the words, the phrases find in those cartoons itself. But also, we need to see how things are presented in different ways and really be able to show maybe how this cartoon might be related to something that we're reading. So that's another area. And last but not least, um, although we won't be going into graphics and charts and data representations today, that is of social studies. And our students need to have those skills for social studies as well as for science. So keep that in mind as we're moving through. So I want you to take a look at the high impact indicators. We've talked about this before in terms of the high impact indicators when we're talking RLA and math, but there's some things in social studies. We can help our students understand these types of things 
it can impact in other areas. Just being able to determine a central idea of a primary, secondary source, when they're reading something else, it won't be called a central idea, it'll be called a main idea. We want our students to understand cause and effect. And we see other places as well. We plant. There are a couple that are a little bit different here. Um, you have uh, how we look at things in that historical context. How did that shape what that author wrote? I'll give you an example. Um, the, the letter from the Birmingham jail written by um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. When you take a look at, at that letter, we have to look at it in the view of what was happening in history at that point and how that shaped what he said. Likewise, if we look back even to Thomas Jefferson or John Adams, we see how the times that historical context, what was happening around them, made a difference as well. So keep those things in mind <clears throat> as we're going through. To me, as I look at students around in different places, what I see is that political cartoons pose the greatest difficulty for students. And much of that has to do with the fact that don't always understand the text in which things are written. So let's take a look first at the tools of the cartoonist. Use the main elements um, when they're conveying what their thoughts are, their point of view. They use symbolism, which we're used to seeing that on that particular slide, you see Iwo Jima. And that is symbolic of that hard work and, and the intensity of, you know, in World War II of them being able to plant that flag um, after vicious, vicious fighting was going on. The other thing that happens, cartoonists look at captions and labels because that can clarify different things that are there. Um, we actually have up there in one of them, we have a label and we have some captioning that's provided. The other thing is we have an analogy. And we know that's a comparison between two unlike things. And everyone knows that life is like a box of chocolates. We all heard that um, as we watched the Forrest Gump movie. The other thing that we see is irony. And if you take a look at those children up on the top cartoon, up in the right-hand corner, it says, caution, children playing. But ironically, what are they doing? Using all their electronics and nobody's back there on the swing set. The play is different. Everyone is isolated. And then, of course, we always have exaggeration. And political figures, they might as well get over it. They're always going to be seeing that if they're done in a political cartoon, there's probably going to be some feature that is exaggerated in some way. Just as with Richard Nixon, it was always his nose. Um, the same thing happened even when, if you looked back in the day, and I'll date myself, of Bob Hope. If there was ever a cartoon, they always had his nose was like a ski slope. So it, those are things that, that we understand and our students need to understand what those cartoonists are doing with those things. They're not just drawings. They have a purpose for being there. So... If we take a look at these, and just a couple of examples. There's our symbols. Yes, we are heading into the next election cycle. In fact, we've been in it, I think, continuously for the past 35 years. But the symbolism for the two parties. If we take a look at the exaggeration and the distortion, 
the emphasis here becomes one of when you see this ball and chain and a student, they talk about it in terms of not billions of dollars, but a trillion, a little over a trillion dollars in student debt that's out there. But again, what is the cartoonist doing is drawing attention to this issue of student loan debt. Now, we always have stereotypes. And what do we have here? Well, we have either the lobbyist or as they called it, the fat cat, um, who always had lots of money. And so of course, had to be much larger. And they were looking at that. A caricature? I like this cartoon a lot because it talks fear and prejudice. And when the, this person looks in the mirror and says, know your enemy. Well, who is your enemy? Your enemy becomes yourself. Trying to draw that inference in of what is this that we're looking at when we look at fear and prejudice. And of course, irony. And in this particular case, we go back to the elections again. The end is near. Good. I can't wait for this election to be over. And that's what all of us are like as we get close to uh, elections, whether they are um, the elections at you know the state level itself or, or taking a look at national elections. So let's think now in terms of where we can go with this. In U.S. student history, and of course, what do we have? The student with the iPad. But mom, I do know my history. To prove it, I'll Google Abe Lincoln. We have to keep in mind that for many students today, electronics are a part of what they are. And many of them feel that, well, why do I need to learn this? when as I'm looking at different things, I can find that information. That's something that we have to work with students in terms of trying to begin to change some of that attitude itself. So let's take a little look at the political cartoons. Keep in mind that back in the day, early days, um, of the, this country and even before its official founding, it really started out as a street level phenomenon. Um, what you would find is it was posted on walls or passed around, newspapers would publish. And it really was a way to spread political ideas. And what happened as a result, it became a really valuable selling point for newspapers and magazines. So we began to see more and more as we go looking at different pieces here, um, you know that political cartoons can, they can make you mad. They can um, make you sad. They can sometimes be something that just really is disgusting. They are designed to make you think and to make students think as they're going through because Cartoonists are able to come through and they're expressing their opinions, sometimes by attacking someone, sometimes by praising them. Sometimes it's all about satire, or caricature, but there are lots of different ways in which they express opinions. So, most of you will probably recognize this one, Join or Die, um, which was the first political cartoon. It was created by Ben Franklin, and that was in 1754. So we were still away, away from declaring our independence. But they were trying to look at this thing called the Albany Plan of Union. And they were looking at how to make this centralized government within the 13 colonies. The idea being that if the snake is cut into eight parts to symbolize each of the colonies along the American coast. The goal was to point out the dangers without unity. So join or die. And although they did finally accept this um, from seven 
of the British North American colonies. They adopted the plan for them to unite. There never was a way to carry it out. So when we look at it, we look at it as kind of that first little step in looking at um, a unified and a united, being united under one government. And comes one of the first important proposals that came along. And of course, we know that from there, there were quite a few. So let's take a couple looks at things. A couple of caveats. King political cartoons. They are expressions of opinion. And everybody has their own opinion about things. They use emotion to persuade others to accept those opinions. So they're trying to convince you that what they're seeing through their eyes is how you should see things. They're not evidence in terms of that, of the way things were or the way any, everyone else felt about them. They were that cartoonist expression of opinion. They're heavily biased. And so as you work with students, that is something in which they need to be aware, that there's a great deal of bias that's coming in with those cartoons. And in order for students to truly understand them, you have to make inferences in order to do that. Now, if you'll notice at the bottom, um, I'm going to recommend this site to you. It's called teachinghistory.org. And you know, when you pull down the PowerPoint itself, you will actually have this um, URL, so you can go out and take a look at the materials. Excellent materials for working with students, not just students, but about lots of different things that are out there. So there's some things that you need to help your students as and questions that they should be asking when you're working with political cartoons. You have to ask them in terms of those cartoons, what conditions might cause this given rise to this particular cartoon? What was going on that may have been uh, part of the issue here? Who was it appealing to? That cartoonist is trying to get that message out. And from our student standpoint, who were they trying to pull into this? Last thing is there's some values that are always tied up into this. And what values was that cartoonist trying to express either overtly, just flat out, you can see it, everybody can see it, or more implicitly. So let's take a look at a time. If you have an I strongly recommend that you go out to read, write, think, and that you create timelines of your own. Um, they have a free timeline maker, and you can set up your timeline to include lots of different but in this particular case, what I tried to do is go in and look at the standpoint of the major things that were going on as we're going through the history of the U.S. So take just a minute to look at those cartoons. What you see within this is you see a span from 1754, that very first cartoon from Benjamin Franklin, all the way to 2008. And as you look within those different cartoons, you're going to see a number of different things that are coming in. 
we can see that winning team where we have Congress and we have the, the, the three branches of government and together. We have the issue that we address today. Um, we look at the election. We can look at labor issues and the women's vote and We can also look at prohibition. Big issue within the U.S. when the prohibition came in to be, and then when it left. The Great Depression, 1963, when we see Lincoln wept. And we can look back and say, well, that was when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And then last but not least, Wall Street. If I were working with students, these are some of the different eras that I think our students could relate to. They could relate to these different pieces because you can make a tie back to current events that are going on. And so I could take each of these cartoons and we could talk some about those different issues. And have students get a little understanding of the history of the United States. Now, it's certainly not going to give everything that you might want students to learn, but what a great way to engage students, to get them to talk about different things, to learn about issues that in some cases we're still dealing with today. But let's take a look at one other thing. What does the Constitution say about that? This is from the National Archives. And so take a look at this particular one. Think in terms of how students would read in this and what you could teach from here. First of all, we have the issue, well, we should probably guarantee free speech at some point. And we know that there are those who look at cartoons and they go, you know, I hate the way they portray me and would we have to cover that? Come on, is that really necessary? But yes, cartoons are about free speech, but this could open us up about other issues within the Constitution and other rights that are granted within that. So we're going to go through and test your knowledge. So here's what I'm asking you to do. If you're going to be seeing a series of political cartoons, each cartoon is associated with a specific clause in the Constitution. I'm not asking you to tell me what clause. I don't want Article 1, Section 3, Clause 2. I don't want that. What I really want you to do is what's the issue? What is it that they are discussing within this? And if you would, I'm going to have you just jot your answer down in the question box. So. Everybody ready? What is this referring to? And I see it coming on in, the Electoral College. Yes, as we're going through, this is something that students are talking about or that people are talking about. Should we have the Electoral College or the popular vote, where we have people who win elections because of the Electoral College, but they don't win the popular vote. And as I have someone, Carrie comes, uh, no, Melissa, who's coming in, talking about Teddy Roosevelt's Bull Moose Party and the Electoral College. So you can see the different things that are included within there. 
So we have the Electoral College. Okay, let's take a look at another one. And where are we going now? What part of, it is Truman back in the 1950s, but it is about a special privilege that the president has, and it is the veto power of the president, that presidential veto at the executive branch. One thing that, you know, we look at of this test is about civics and government. So what we want to do in looking at these things is to say, okay, um, let's see if we can help our, under our students understand what these are. And also um, from Gates, we have using the veto wisely. Um, but again, the whole issue within this particular cartoon comes back to the veto. Let's try another one. Okay, what are we talking about? We have Truman standing there with this union and a state of the budget in 25,000 words. It says, read it and weep. And then you've got Congress. Okay, what within the Constitution addresses the budget? Congress. And we also deal with that report to Congress. So the, the president reports to Congress, Jean um, Freeney, thank you, and that Congress has to approve the budget. That the budget actually is generated from Congress. It is not something, I mean, there are recommendations that come up in the executive branch, but who has the power of the purse? That comes back to Congress itself. And we also, Lorraine is talking about that there's budget oversight. So that's another one. So we have to look at helping our students understand what we have within the Constitution itself and who has what powers. Because has said here, there are three branches, there are equal powers that are granted into each one of those. And there's something else that they're granted as well, and that's called checks and balances. So let's look at another one. Ah, uh, yes, and we have a census coming up this year, 20. And Carrie, thank you so much a census every 10 years. And why is it important? It's important because it determines representation, that distribution of the House of Representatives. We don't need to go in, oh, and Carrie brought up another good point, and funding. We don't need to go into great detail in working with students on these types of things, but they do need to have an overall understanding of it. And when you think about how this can help within your communities and for your students to have a voice, they need to participate in that census. It's really important as they're going through um, to how representation is distributed across the country. Y'all are doing a great job with all of this. And what is that? Who is represented? The Supreme Court, yes, y'all broke into that one very quickly. You have those justices that are walking up the steps. This cartoon was actually done when the Supreme Court, the building itself, was actually first built. And you have those Supreme Court justices that are going up through there. And Emily, yes, you brought up a good point. 
in this particular one at Supreme Court, you see all men as they're walking in. And there have been some major changes since this particular one came into being. But it does look at the entire process of the Supreme I really like um, this series. This is a part of the scavenger hunt um, that was done by the National Archives. There are a number of other cartoons. You will see that when you pull that information um, from the website or from the handouts here. Um, but again, what's the purpose here? The purpose is to get students to have that understanding of some of the big ideas that are out there, the big overarching things within civics and government. If we could help just learn some of those, it would make a very big difference. But you know, that's all old stuff. Let's take a look and see if we can't look at some other things. George Santayana said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And I don't know how many times we hear about that from a lot of different people. And so as we take a look, you know, it's important that we really begin to look at how we help students see what has happened and that there is a cycle to things as we move through. So let's start with one. Look to the left and you see what was in photographs and newspapers in 1929, the Great Depression, when you had 25%, you had the stock market that crashed, um, you had so many people who, um, in this particular case, were part of an evacuation sale, but at the same time, you know, you had um, the Dust Bowl going on. So many things. Take a look to the present. 2008, what do we have again? We have a recession. Um, we actually look at this and we see the people in line at the banks. And instead of evacuation sales, we have home foreclosures. So even though this doesn't do it in cartoons, it is one way to get students to see how past and present can have connections. And you can actually tell the story. So let's take a look. So from the cartoonist point of view, this was 2008. You'll be pleased to know that technically we're not in a recession. There's good old, and in front of him you see a family and you see all these big boulders falling on them with foreclosures and food costs and gas prices and credit crunch and the shrinking dollar, all of those things. What did we see in the past? We called it the Brothers in Distress. This came out in 1935. This was from the Chicago Herald and Examiner. And we had the plague of greedy politicians and taxes. And we had the plague of war mad dictators in Europe. But all of that being carried on top of the people who were struggling just to survive. Let's take a look at this. History repeats. If you take a look at gerrymandering, and I live in North Carolina, and today the North Carolina Supreme Court actually ruled that the present maps that are in place for the 2020 elections are null and void because they are part of partisan gerrymandering. And you can see Congressional District 12 as it rolls around all the way from Charlotte up to Durham. But you see those things in other places. Gerrymandering. And we're your elected officials. Exactly. We elected you to be our voters. All talking about gerrymandered districts. What a great way to talk with students and to get them to understand what does it mean when we have gerrymandering that's going on? What what exactly is that? That's a funny term with it. But, whoops, sorry. 
Let me go back forward. But here's where it began. This is back in 1812. And we have it from Elkanah Tisdale, who was this monster that was called gerrymandering. And you can see how it looked like this big monster that was there. And all of these different towns and areas were included in it. Let's take another look at something. How about wage inequality? I'm sure many of you have heard of that. Oh, another day, another dollar. And the woman walking behind says, another day, another 77 cents. Now, did we see that before? That's 2019. Well, as the fellows don't say, another day, another 75 cents. That particular one, if you come back and take a look at it, not that long ago, 1999. But again, looking at that same issue. And how many of you have heard of the swamp? Everybody wants to drain the swamp, that they're lobbyists and there's big money that's in politics and there's all kinds of different things that are going on. And so what people um, are looking at here is this particular one, we finally done it, America, strongly worded, bipartisan, lip service to put the lobbies on notice. This is one of those where the actual uh, labeling, those types of things are what's so important within this. You have both parties, Dems and the GOP, the Senate bill to, quote, limit gifts from registered lobbyists. Long line, the revolution. So we talk about the swamp now, but did they ever have a swamp before? And this cartoon actually comes from the era of prohibition. And as we can see, everyone is lined up and their hands are all out. Helping students to understand that are they, they're looking for that handout, they're looking for someone to grease their palms and help them along the way. Same swamp, different day. Bring out that was included in here, and Jean Perini brought this up. This makes great material for writing as well. And she's absolutely right. What an opportunity for a student to actually be able to, you know, show that comparison um, from one to the other. And within this, I have Melissa who says, in first that all politicians are for sale. Yes, now keep in mind, what are we talking about within this? We're talking that bond that whoever the cartoonist is, is showing his or her opinion about something and what big issue. And with Lori, aren't they on the take? That is another th way that students can look at it. But it's to help them get the ideas and get those understandings. So let's take a little bit deeper dive into what we have here. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we want to do with students is, if you notice in this cartoon on the side, this is the toughest puzzle of the world, and we've got to put it together um, of the whole world. And we have FDR, and we have a farm relief puzzle. What we need our students to be able to do is actually start to analyze uh, political cartoons. The one thing that um, I highly recommend as you start this process um, is that you go through and you can use something like this, which is from the National Archives, um, where they start out with, what do you see? I mean, it's very basic. Is the cartoon black and white or is it in color? Is there a caption? What does the caption tell you? And then they begin to look at different parts. This is not something that you would do every time you're working with these, but it is somewhere that you can begin. And we've talked about this in our webinars, how important it is for students to see 
how you work through the process, what you highlight, what you're thinking about. Um, we talked in the past about this thing called making thinking skills visible. And so, and you want to do that because they're not exactly sure where do I start. This particular one, uh, this first one that you're looking at, graphic organizer, is for the novice, meaning that's for that those earlier, those lower level students who maybe are having some real difficulty, or if you have a class and they haven't worked with editorial cartoons or political cartoons, you may want to do this with the entire class because you're actually asking them to look at the details, which is something that our students often miss. Now, you get a little bit higher level, then you begin to take a look in terms of, you know, looking at the cartoon. This is the same type of thing, but it goes at a little bit higher level with words and phrases. Are there visuals or symbols? Who drew it? When is it from? And the most important part is that if our students don't have that historical background to understand, is to help them gain that. One thing that I like to do is the cartoon of the day. And that cartoon of the day can be something current or it could be from the past. Students actually go through and they determine what is that cartoon about, what's the big idea. So here is your task. You're going to see a cartoon in just a moment. I want you to analyze that cartoon, and then I want you, I'm not gonna make you do it on the graphic organizer, but tell me what is the underlying view that is uh, being placed there by that cartoonist. What is this cartoonist trying to tell us? Red box. Hi, Susan, you there? Yes, I'm here. In fact, I everybody time. In fact, can you hear me? Tika? <laughs> Tico? Yes. Okay. Of course, so I'm not able to hear, but I gave them the webinar link um, where it will be posted. Um, some people okay. are responding, some people are not, so, you know, we're okay. just having, I think it's the webinar, the go-to webinar system is having some difficulty. Okay, so taking a look at this cartoon, what many of you have said is that this particular cartoon is a literacy test, and it is having to go through and, quote, read, where people were denied the rights to vote, and specifically, this was designed to keep African Americans from voting, which then led into the civil rights movement itself. One of the comments I had a little earlier, in many of those early cartoons that we looked at, you're not seeing any people of color. And that's absolutely right, because as we look at those early cartoons from the Constitu regarding the Constitution, who was focused? in all those. Most of that was focused back to white men as opposed to having even women that were included. But one thing you'll want to do as you're going through and looking at these is to actually remember that you're going to have, as you look through cartoons and you look on up through the years, then you begin to see the issues um, and where different things came in one cartoon that came in was really making the point about how ironic it is that every American citizen has an equal right to vote, but yet there's a literacy test which is denying them. This one is one of the best of irony when you're taking a look at it. 
that people could be prevented from voting because they could not um, fulfill some weird literacy test that was um, placed in front of them. So let's take a look at one more. And who is the forgotten people here? Well, there's more than just one. But in this particular case, there is a woman who is cleaning the floor as they're sitting there putting that constitution together. But we have to remember that even though that constitution starts out with the fact and, and coming back to that whole issue of all men are created equal, what we know is that that's something that has been an ongoing reach that level of equality. Um, there are a couple of different things that, and I, I do apologize to all of you where we've had our, our uh, audio cutting in and out, um, but there's some things that as we come in to the end of this at webinar, and we are going to do questions and answers, so we're not ending it, but this portion of it. There's a couple of things I would recommend. Bring in and share cartoons from your hometown paper. Now, I know lots of people don't do the paper anymore, but you can get them online. Um, so you can talk about current issues that are closer to home. That's something that you're going to want to do in beginning this process. The next one is consider doing the cartoon of the day. All you would need is after you've modeled for students several different times, how to go through and analyze a cartoon, then post a cartoon and students on their own are asked to analyze what they see and be able to What that will do is let you know what they understand, what they have challenges with, and then you can address those issues. The constitutional scavenger hunt from the National Archives is excellent. Um, something do with lot the students and really get them some understanding. And so what you're going to do with them to build that understanding of historical events. So where do I go? National Archives, number one. They have 16 different tunes, a transcript to the Constitution. They have worksheets. And thank you, they actually have an answer key that goes along with that. Don't forget your National Archives because as it says up here, there are educator resources that go far beyond things that are here. The other thing, if you want current cartoons, look at Kegel.com. Um, if you look at Kegel, he is a cartoonist. Um, he has uh, 60 cartoonists that also post to his website. So you can find things on everything that you could ever want to see. Word to the wise, don't think about starting this at 11 o'clock at night because you will be looking at for a long time because there's so much here that is so interesting. Another place, Docs Teach. Docs Teach is a, another excellent it's an online tool from the National Archives, you go in, do a search, and you look at political cartoons, do the search, and you'll find a lot of resources that are provided there as well. And don't forget the Library of Congress. There are also classroom sets of materials. This one is on political cartoons, so you have lesson plans, uh, they have the resources that go along with those. And this really lets students pair a cartoon with another historical document. So it is a way to help students explore the cartoons, but also explore specific items um, that are included there. So at this point, I'm going to open it up, and if you have questions, I'll have you, um, if you'll just type them in to the um, question box, we can do those for you. If there are other things, keep in mind, a couple of different things. If you want the resources, 
and um, we want to go th back through and, and take a look at different pieces here. All of this will be posted on the GED.com website um, within the next few days.